All right, folks, so today we're going to look at a paper by E.F. Codd, and this is the paper that laid the theoretical foundation for the field of relational databases. Codd was awarded the Turing Prize for his work in this field back in 1981. One could actually argue that modern civilization runs on databases, and almost all of those databases are relational. So this is a paper with absolutely phenomenal impact. Not only did this paper spell out the relational model for organizing data, this was actually the first time someone had specified an abstract model for data representation. We want a data model that is not dependent on how the data is actually organized in the machine, its internal representation. And we also want a data model where changes in the query and update patterns don't necessitate a change in how the data is physically laid out. The author calls this idea data independence, the idea that as the types of data change and the representation of data changes, the application programs and user activities don't have to change as a result. The author starts by looking out at how data is expressed in present systems. And at the time, all the existing ways of storing data were very dependent on the physical representation of the data. It was hard to change the data representation without then also affecting the application programs. And this was because the programs were still cluttered with details of how the data was actually physically represented. To dig into this idea further, the author specifies three kinds of data dependencies, ordering dependence, indexing dependence, and access path dependence. Ordering dependence arises when the way you access or query data is dependent on the physical ordering of records. If an application depends on how the data is ordered physically, it's going to break if for some reason you need to change the ordering of that data. Now, theoretically, an index is a mechanism that is used purely for improving the performance of a database system. And the question becomes, can application programs and query patterns remain the same as indices of the underlying data are changed? This is what is called indexing dependence. There were some systems at the time where the indices had to be manually referred to in the queries themselves. These were called indexing chains, and then these would not work correctly if later these chains were removed or changed. And lastly, we come to access path dependence. Most of the existing database systems at the time used a tree or a network model of data representation. And what that meant was that the way you access a piece of data was by following a path along a tree or a path along a graph to get to that data. And that was also the way you queried data. And this meant that the way data was read and written was highly tied with the way the data was laid out in a tree structure. It was not at all easy to change the structure of this tree or this graph without also changing all the programs that access this data. So now that the author has spelled out the kinds of problems, namely data dependence, that existing models of databases have, he comes to proposing a relational view of data. And the model is really simple. The model is based on relations as we understand them from set theory. So given sets S1 to Sn, a relation on these sets is a set of n tuples where the first element of a tuple is taken from the first set, the second element is taken from the second set, and so on. So this is intuitively pretty easy to grasp in terms of a two-dimensional table, where the rows are tuples and each column is an element of a particular set. I think this intuitive simplicity of understanding the relational model is part of what led to its widespread success. A relation has the following properties. Each row is an n-tuple from the relation. The ordering of rows does not matter. Each row is distinct, so we can't have two rows that are exactly the same. And the ordering of columns is significant as well, but 
he loosens this further down in the paper. The significance of each column is conveyed by labeling it with the name of the corresponding domain. So again, if you visualize tables as a 2D structure, the column headers are the domains of each column and each row is one and tuple, is one element in the relation. Now, why should the ordering of columns matter? And in this original model of relations, the ordering of columns matters because you could have two columns that are from the same domain, so they're of the same type, but they mean slightly different things in each column. And given this definition of relations, all the data in a database can essentially be viewed as a set of relations that vary over time. They are inserted, they're deleted, they're modified, and so on. And here the author simplifies the model a little bit. He says relationships are the unordered counterparts of relations. So this is where the order of columns does not matter either. In our original definition, we saw that the order of rows doesn't matter. And if you loosen the definition of relation to relationships, the order of columns does not matter at all. And when we run into a situation where there are two or more identical columns, we can simply disambiguate them by specifying what role each column plays and adding that role name to the name of the column. This is a pretty simple model. What the user sees is a relational model of data consisting of a set of time varying relationships, which is essentially a set of tables, and they don't know anything more about this table other than the name of the table and the names of each of the columns of the table. Now onto some other definitions which will sound fairly familiar if you've used modern databases. Remember that domain is basically the same thing as a column and a relation is the same thing as a table as we understand it now. Now if there is a domain which can uniquely identify each element in a relation that's called a primary key. Note that a primary key need not be just one element, it could even be a combination of domains. So a collection of columns could be a primary key. And now that we have organized our data as relational tables, a very common use case is for elements of one relation or table to reference elements in another relation. And we call a domain or a combination of domains of a relationship R a foreign key if it is not the primary key of R, but it is the primary key of some other table S. So if I have an element in my table that can become the primary key when referencing elements in another table, that is called a foreign key. So primary key, foreign key, these are all very familiar terms to anyone who's used databases. Note that each domain need not be a simple atomic domain. You could have non-atomic complex values that are part of a column. The author uses the example where an employee relation could have a domain or could have a column that is the salary history. And the salary history itself is a relation that has date and salary. So relations or tables can be nested. And now that we have the possibility of having nested tables, we also want a mechanism by which we can unnest them and make them simple 2D tables. And there's a very simple procedure for taking a set of nested relations and then normalizing them to come up with flat tables which only have atomic domains. The example here will illustrate that Say we have an employee relation which has nested relations, job history and salary history. And here we see in italics the primary key of each of these relations. To normalize this, all we have to do is walk down this tree and append the primary key of the parent to the child. So this is what the normalized relation looks like, where if we go one level down to job history, the primary key of job history is now its own primary key, which was job date, and the primary key of its parent, the employee relation, which was the ID of the employee. Similarly, the primary key 
of the salary history table is its own primary key, which was salary date, combined with the two primary keys of its two parents. So that's the primary key of the job history table, and that's the primary key of the employee table. And the reason we want to normalize our relations is because it makes it much easier to store them and also to transfer them in bulk between systems. Now that the author has defined what data can look like when expressed in a relational model, he turns to the issue of how to query it using a data language. Having a relational model of data actually makes it possible to now have a data language based on predicate calculus which can be used to read and manipulate this data. Now, this paper doesn't go into the details of the language itself, but specifies some high-level properties that such a language must satisfy. And the most crucial property of this data language is that it is not defined in terms of execution, but in terms of its descriptive ability, that it's declarative. And to anyone who's used SQL, this will be really familiar because SQL is a declarative language. You specify your SQL query in terms of your tables and columns and how the data is laid out, what the indices are, how that is actually computed on top of the data is completely abstracted out. Next, we come to the operations that we can define on these relations or tables. The first one is permutation. And a permutation of a relation is simply another relation with the columns permuted. Now, since we're dealing with relationships where the order of the columns does not matter, permutation is not really relevant to this model. We want the queries answerable by a stored relation to be the same no matter what permutation of columns we're talking about. The only time this might be relevant is if we're trying to optimize for performance. Projection is the operation which takes a relation and then extracts a relation which consists of a subset of the domains or a subset of the columns of that relation. And the way that's formally defined is that if we take a list of indices that is K long and we project that into a relationship that has N domains, where we're assuming that N is greater than or equal to K, then the projection of R on L, which is denoted as pi L R, is then the K array relation whose jth column is just the jth index from L. And we remove all duplication from the resulting rows because a relation or a relationship is still a set. Next, we come to something that's familiar to everyone who's ever written SQL, and that's a join. If we have two binary relations, R and S, the join of R and S is defined as the relation which has three tuples, A, B, and C, where A and B are from the first relationship R, and B and C are from the second relationship S. So they have the element B in common. And here's a really simple example of a join. We have a table R with supply and part, and a table S with part and project. And when we join them, we form all tuples where part is the same. That is also called the natural join. And just like we defined joining two relations, we can generalize that to joining three or more relations where we have subsequent elements that are in common between each pair of relations. So in this case, B is common to R and S, and C is common to S and T. Another operation we can define is restriction. And restriction is a way in which we can use a relation S to restrict a relation R and arrive at a subset. So this is easier to show with an example. Say we have this relation R with columns S, P, and J, and we try to restrict it with this relation S with columns P and J. The result of this restriction is the subset of R where the values of P and J from S match the values of P and J from R and that's this table. This is sort of similar to how we use the WHERE clause in SQL to restrict 
the rows we get back from a table. Now let's look at the idea of redundancy within relations. In order to talk about redundancy, we first have to talk about the notion of derivability. So suppose theta is a collection of operations on relation. We can say that a relation R is theta derivable from a set S of relations if there is a sequence of operations from theta which can yield R from members of S. So if you can take S and apply operations from theta and arrive at R, R is theta derivable from S. A set of relations has strong redundancy if it has one relation that has a projection which is derivable from other projections of other relations in the set. For example, if you had a relation employee which has columns for serial number, name, manager number, and manager name, the column for manager name is redundant because manager name is a subset of name. And given manager number as a key, we can look it up in this employee relation itself to arrive at the name of the manager. We mostly have strong redundancy in relations for user convenience and also because old programs can refer to all obsolete relationships in the named set. We also have a notion of weak redundancy, which is when a set of relations contains a relation that is not derivable from other members, but derivable from some join of projections from relations in this collection. In other words, if you have a table that is derivable by a join operations from other tables in that set of relations, that table is weakly redundant. Lastly, we look at the idea of consistency and we take a very general definition of consistency. If C is a set of time varying relations and Z is a set of constrained statements, we can take an instantaneous snapshot in time V from the relation C and see if V satisfies the constraints in Z. And if it does, then we call that consistent. Now, it's a very challenging problem to actually check for consistency because snapshots of relations could be really large. There are many ways in which you could check for consistency, which this paper doesn't go into, but broadly, one way is to do them at runtime. Each time Time you perform an operation check if it still is consistent with the properties you want to enforce that will of course slow these operations down the other method is to check for consistency periodically as a batch operation to summarize, this paper defined an abstract relational model of data that was data independent, which means that the way the data was read and processed was independent of the physical layout of the data. And then this paper defined the operations that could take place on top of this data to manipulate it. So that was Codd's seminal paper that laid out the relational model of data I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time.